but was a communication expert in a ministry, advisor. advisor, communications advisor in a ministry, the mandate following the one that I was, right? Uh, yeah. Do you have a presentation? Um, no. So, uh, Dr. Stetsonov, with enlightened to point you. Uh, I'm the only exempt of what my esteemed colleague Madalina said of not having a PR or communication education and still doing the job. Quite successful. I would say despite our minister, not because. But nevertheless, still, back to the topic. Well, plenty of my colleagues who spoke before me touched upon the things which I intended to include, so I'll be really, really short. Which is, a, let's say, a specialty of mine these days. Enlightenment 2.0, uh, I think it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty telling. You all know probably, well, maybe I should refrain by using this word, but still probably what the enlightenment is, right? Well, a short crash intro in a couple of sentences, the enlightenment was about a couple of things, namely uh, spreading out literacy in Europe, it's a European phenomenon, and at least according to the uh, Britannica Academic Edition online, and its goal, its goal was to illuminate the world like never before by the knowledge generated through some glorious minds, including, just to name a few, René Descartes, for example, or the mathematician, Gottfried Leibniz, John Locke of England, Thomas Hobbes as well, uh, from Germany, from France, plenty of names, who actually mounted a challenge to the status quo represented by the Roman Catholic Church. So first of all, they fought for literacy and then to spread the knowledge generated by alternative channels, non-religious ones. And just to give you an idea of how important their task was. Do you know, by the way, in medieval Europe, of the ages preceding the start of the Enlightenment, which is dated somewhere in the beginning of the 17th century, which was one of the most severe crimes in Europe at the time? Probably you do not. Uh, when a guy first assembled a device in mind somewhere in the beginning of, I would say, 15th century, the first book he printed out, actually, as an edifice of his device was the Bible. And I'm talking the Bible. The, guy, the guy's name is Johann Gutenberg, of course. And by the time his device became popular and spread out across Europe through publishers and publishing houses, as a result, the church actually made it quite clear to the Christian dome that having a Bible at home is a sin and you, your soul goes to hell just for being uh, so or being reported having a Bible at home. Guess why? I mean it's easy but still I'll say it aloud. Having a Bible at home means that you directly communicate with God. You don't need interpreter. You see the trick? No one else tells you what actually God wants to say. I mean, it's there for you. And you're able to read it and get the message for yourself. That's why I love a message uh, which is epitomized by a song by the man in black, Johnny Cash, personal Jesus. <laughs> Probably you've heard it, but by the Cash Mall. A bit popular. Personally. And that's about the enlightenment as it began back there. Jumping nowadays in reality. Last year, actually, the first semester, the fall semester, I started a new course with a colleague in our joint program of political science and mass communication. By the way, I do teach political science, not exactly mass communication or PR studies. And there we had these students, first year uh, of, of, of both specialties, so it was strange for me. 
having such a mixed audience for the first time. Cup, kind of 100 people showed up for the first lecture, it was a bit stressing. <laughs> Later, their number reduced, of course, gradually, <laughs> not least my efforts, of course. But what was the point that at some point, uh, I just shot a couple of questions, extremely provocative, at them, and judging to their responses, it was my decision where and how to approach the matter in this course. The course title is The Modern World. So it was at times both striking and shocking for me and for them. So we, we are in the same mood. We were and we are in the same mood by the end of the semester. And what formed in my mind by the end of the semester, or in the middle of it actually, was that we need both to catch up as soon as possible in many directions, multiple ways. So I used all channels available of delivering information in order to uh, at least not reach, but come closer to the level of the thing which I believe represents or epitomizes the enlightenment 2.0. This is understanding. That is the deficit which each and every professor around the world finds out in the most unpleasant ways, I believe, is missing in his or her classroom. Understanding. What the heck is it all about? Why is it important going to the university? Is it natural to jump from the high school desk in the university hall? Why, 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 why? Missing the point of what? So, uh, through music, movies, uh, books, not that much because young people today hate to read. That's why I really enjoy your messages about Twitter, but that's exactly a point in my direction. Why mm -hmm. people don't read shorter messages? Well, I mean, when you have short messages, you don't need to go, uh, read longer ones. <laughs> not mentioning war and peace, for example, by You know what I mean, right? Yeah. I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, just the volume matters, the size matters. So, understanding was achieved, that's why the number of people in the classroom uh, shrank rapidly. Over a couple of lectures, I managed to reduce the size to no more than 60. <laughs> We have a couple of scandals, but at the end of the, the, the semester, some students came to me uh, telling me, we disagree with you on many things we heard here. You challenged us for many things, we disagree strongly most of the times, but we believe, we think we got the idea. And I said, okay, tell me, what was the point of it? And they said, uh, you challenged us. And I said, yay, here we go. Hmm. That was the point. Not to rely anymore on stereotypes, but start thinking for yourselves. It's good what your parents or your teachers in high school taught you. They trained you for life, and that's good. It's necessary. But it's just the first footsteps along a very, very long way. I mean, it depends on your lifespan, but still a long way of self-education and understanding life. That's the point of it. Regardless of the discipline you will choose to learn or not to follow or not in the university, it's about life. And if you fail to understand that, everything you do is useless. You're just losing your time, which is a definite measure, by the way. It has a beginning and an end. And as the Buddhists say, it's one breath in, one breath out, and that's it. For life, we call it, for sure. So, that was the point. Yes, they got the first part of my message, the challenge. And the second one was that, uh, sorry, dear colleagues, but reading is not about education. Reading belongs to the old school of training, including myself being a quite uh, profound reader. I love books, I adore books. I have at least 10 on my bad side from the left side, on the right side again another 10 and 20 over my head. But uh, what my experience taught me over these last two decades, for example, 
is that yes, size matters, volumes matters, number of pages matters, but if you fail to understand what was it about, well, you lost your time, meaning that you lost the precious, precious ins and outs of reading, which you can spare for other days. So understanding is my mission at this university, and not only, and it's a hard work, it's a hard job, but uh, the, the thing that I see plenty of people around me doing or making efforts that way and uh, attempting for this direction is pretty encouraging, and that's the answer of a question which I received recently. Why are we still here? Because of that. Thank you. <laughs>